think with our emphasis. And uh, I, I know at some point I was part of that and I, I know what work they do, the kind of links that they have in the UK institutions and those in Uganda. I, I want to, to re-echo one or two things before I go to the specific thing that I'm, I'm happy that Dr. Alimi made a very nice overview of what really happens in Africa as from CDC, because as we go through all this number of epidemics and pandemics, it is important that we realize the importance of all these issues. We, we have seen a number of these infections, emerging and re-emerging infections in Africa. And we are looking at how do we interrupt the transmission in case we have an epidemic or a pandemic. So this transmission can be from patient to patient, from patient to the healthcare workers, or from both patients, healthcare workers to our communities. And once it has reached the community, it is a very difficult thing to, to stop. And that means we have to work very hard. In line with that, we also have the healthcare associated infections. These are infections which are friends to our antibiotics. And we need to work very hard to ensure that we stop them from applying in numbers. We stop them from getting used to our medicines. So the more reason why we have the antimicrobial uh, resistance uh, fight, which is always very important that we work hand in hand. And in, in terms of what is happening in Uganda, we have this antimicrobial resistance governance mechanism, which is at the national level. And I'm happy that my colleagues from the One Health platform are here. We have the One, One, One Health platform, which are the, 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 they are reported to by the Uganda National Microbial, Microbial, Microbial Resistance Committee. And under this committee, we have a number of other, other committees like the, the public awareness on training and education. We have the infection prevention and control. We have the microbial stewardship. We have the surveillance. Uh, we have the research and innovation. All these committees, they report to this national antimicrobial resistance and all reports to the One Health. So we, we have a coordinated system that we always do look at in Uganda. And all these are being worked at and coordinated at different levels. The Ministry of Health look at part of it, and especially when we are looking at infection prevention and control. It is so key that at this point, as we handle the, the COVID-19, it is very important that we really emphasize on the infection prevention and control, which is hand in hand the work with antimicrobial resistance. So we, we need to look at how do we look at this antimicrobial stewardship. So when the, our important issue now that we look at is that everybody is important. We're looking at the clinicians. We are looking at the pharmacists. We are looking at the nurses. We are looking at the laboratory specialists. Everybody contributes to this because when we work together, then we are going to put ourselves in the position where we can now contribute to this stewardship. The, the healthcare workers, which spread through all these areas, are responsible to see how do we ensure that we don't have this antimicrobial resistance. So all in all, what we are saying is that at the different levels of our health system delivery, we must put in some place some kind of, of, of stewardship. And in Uganda, we have the health system is being in a, in a decentralized level, in three levels, that we have the primary, we have the secondary, and we have the tertiary. So at the primary health care, we also have 
our system at the secondary, at the secondary and at the national. So the regional referral hospitals, which are the, the main one that coordinates at the regional level, we have well-established medicine and therapeutic committees, and these play a very big role in understanding what kind of medicine we need at those regional level. They also get, help us in monitoring how medicines are being used and what kind of medicine we need to use at those other at those levels. They also help us in determining what are the consumption rates, what are the medicine need, the medicine need, and what is the consumption need. And at, at some point, they can help us to continue to conduct the national antimicrobial consumption survey, and this can fit into what the Minister of Health can be thinking of or planning to do. And this uh, augurs very well with what we are, we are talking about this, the Commonwealth Partnership in Microbial Stewardship. So when we work on this, we are looking at how do we work together, government, the partners, and the different health institutions in ensuring that we, we have the, 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 the problem under control. But as we do this, we also have some key documents that we need to look at. At any level, you must have a document that guides you on how you are going to discharge your, your, your duties. In Uganda, we have the essential drug list. We have the clinical guidelines. And at each level of, of service delivery, these documents are there that guides what should be used to treat what kind of diseases. So we, 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 are, we are guided by a number of those, those documents. And the different specialists, like the clinicians, the laboratory specialists, the nurses, and the, the pharmacies, they also have their guidelines. What do they use? What can they use as external quality uh, assurance that can make that work be within the range of what we are thinking of? So I, I think it's important that the different uh, uh, professionals, they emphasize on the, the, the standard operating procedures, the, the documents that they should use to ensure that when we are mm -hmm. having this antimicrobial stewardship, we, we, are, we look at those as the guiding principles in what should help us in, in understanding how this, these documents, how, how this uh, issue should be addressed. As we do this, there are a lot of other challenges that we are facing. It has already been mentioned, the issue of human resource. Sometimes you go to a facility, you find that we don't have enough human resource. You don't have the pharmacies. You may find the nurses are the one prescribing. You may have find the nurses the one dispensing the medicine. So the issue of human resource should be looked at squarely if you are going to avoid this the antimicrobial resistance. Another one which we need to look at, the funding. If you are going to do this, we need to do some. This stewardship, we need to do some survey. If you are going to do the survey, what we have done in doing the survey, getting the data to inform policy, is really very important to us. And mainly when we are doing this, we are looking at Ministry of Health, we are looking at the Ministry of Agriculture, but there are so many other people who are key players, like Ministry of Water and Environment. They are very important in looking at how do we avail water in our health facilities so that this IPC is, is, is done to the door. The sanitation is proper. So there are other people who should come on, on, on ground. So the important or the, the, the mainstream ministries, departments and agency, they should come on board to work with us. And commonly our epidemics has been in terms of zoonotic infections. So when you are looking at diseases of animal coming into the human population, this also invites the other ministries, maybe like the Uganda Wildlife Authority, they should come on board looking at the, the disease conditions within the wild animals, within the animals. And then we relate it, that's why I say mainly agriculture and Ministry of Health, they work together. But also the wild animals 
are also there that may their diseases may be transmitted to the human beings because of the life that we, the kind of living that we do. Either we live near the, the, the forest where these wild animals stay, or sometimes we encroach on the environment of these wild animals and then we eat the wild meat and then we get this infection. I think it is important that we look at those as we are discussing this antimicrobial stewardship. It is important that those areas should be addressed and when we address them, then we can, can see where are we heading. And I'm sure when the, this, this uh, uh, partnership was being done, we were looking at those, those areas. But I, I want to, to, to mainly look at what are the priority areas that we should be tackling when we are looking at, as we tackle the uh, antimicrobial resistance. One is that we, we need to, to look at these medicine and therapeutic committees, which are very important. And we want to emphasize that we should, as possible, form these committees in all health facilities so that they guide us on which kind of medicine we should use at, that, at different levels and what could be the consumption rate. And that will make sure that whatever gain that we have got, we can sustain it. Another thing is we need to look at the technical assistance from the other people which can work with us to make sure we, we, we continue sustaining the gains that we have already got. And we, we, we do this because we know we may not have all the knowledge and the experience that can make us do uh, the kind of work that we, we have. Uh, in Uganda, we have the, 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 the National Support Supervision Guideline, and this allows people from the center, people from national level, to go down to, to work with the local, the, the lower the people at the lower level to ensure that the, the documents that we have, the guidelines that we have, are being properly implemented. So that support provision is also very well uh, put in place. And then that also uh, gives us the position of the mentorship of the people who may not know what we really want to do. And especially as I've already mentioned, at some health facilities, the human resources are really lacking. So we need to look at that. But as we do this, we also need to get, get to gather the information, the data that we can forward to the Minister of Health for analysis. And if you analyze those data at particular intervals, it will inform actions and change policies of the ministry that we, we, if we know a particular medicine may not be working in, on a particular kind of disease condition, it will be better in our clinical guidelines say, let's change this as a first line drugs which we can we can use. But above all, we need to promote the operational research in areas of antimicrobial resistance with the interest of emphasizing on the infection prevention and control. I, I want to say that why that issue of infection prevention and control is a key thing that if we use it very well, if we implement it, if we practice it, it will be a, change, a, a key changing tool to all what we are going to do in our health facilities. Our chair, I, I thought I would talk about this, but I want to conclude again by saying, thank you so much Pat, for being able to get the funding for us to do this uh, stewardship, the partner, uh, antimicrobial stewardship. I want to thank colleagues who have really worked very hard to ensure that this study, which took place from 2019 up to this year, were able to be carried out. Thank you very much as a, as a Minister of Health. We want to thank you. We look forward to having the final report of those five studies which we have done in the different parts of the country. If we, we, we get it, we'll see how we can present it to the management of the Ministry of Health and see how we can implement the, the report. 
from the different areas. I want to thank you and and here. Yeah, thank you so much. And over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amoni, for those uh, excellent remarks. Um, I think it's really an honor. Most of the Uganda AMR fraternity has joined us. And um, it's good that we are starting off the session with a blessing from the Ministry of Health. So Dr. Mone, thank you for emphasizing the importance for us to share. I think we may have lost Shiva's connection. Let's just wait for a minute to see if she comes back. Yeah, Shiva, Sorry. we can hear you again. Thank you. Sorry, but... apologies for that i'm having connectivity issues let me keep my video off so um i welcome the next uh team the next speaker and that is bo1 to go ahead and share with us your findings uh we are looking forward to to hearing more on what was done at Kawempe National Referral Hospital and Mulago. So the floor is yours. And um, before we start the presentation, I'm kindly requesting for a volunteer out of the participants. One of you, if you can volunteer to take notes and also share feedback uh, when we regroup in the next session, we expected to provide feedback. You're really going to take more very high level notes. Uh, we already have a template prepared. So it's just the keywords. So may I have a volunteer take that up? And Jess uh, has already shared the Google Doc within the chat, which the volunteer will use. Who would like to do this? Grace, would you love to volunteer? Oh, Winnie. Okay, I can see James. James, please go ahead and speak. Hi, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. It's a great pleasure to be speaking at this event. Um, so I, I'm talking on uh, behalf of the uh, Cambridge Kampala Partnership Project. Uh, unfortunately, our Uganda partners can't join us today because <clears throat> they're all busy, unfortunately, with clinical work at the moment, which is understandable uh, given the current COVID situation in Uganda. Uh, so my name is James Whitehorn. I'm a consultant in infectious diseases and microbiology in Cambridge, uh, and, I'm, and I'm part of the Cambridge Kampala partnership. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So maybe, James, just a minute uh, and we wrap up. May I have a volunteer do the notes, please? So that James can go on for this presentation. Okay, Grace has offered to do that. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, so James, the floor is yours. I'm so sorry for that interruption. No, 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 thank you. That's fine. Thanks very much. Uh, so our partnership um, actually started back in 2014 uh, with a, um, initially an academic partnership between uh, Cambridge University uh, and the obstetric services at Malago uh, and, and Makerere University Obstetrics Department. 
Uh, and the focus then was really about improving obstetric care, um, working on preeclampsia uh, and trying to improve outcomes for pregnant women in Uganda. Um, and recognizing that infection is a major contributor to maternal and neonatal mortality uh, among the team in Uganda. There was a, a, a real desire to improve the infection component of that partnership. Um, so with the CWPAMS grant, we added a, a different, an additional strand to the partnership uh, framed around antibiotic stewardship uh, and infection prevention and, and control. And I think one of the real achievements of our partnership was to really embed uh, infection prevention and control activities as a very central focus for the hospitals. Uh, I think uh, as the previous speaker was mentioning, uh, IPC activities are absolutely fundamental to good antibiotic stewardship. Um, and I think that this is really timely actually because of what happened uh, in the months after we started our partnership with the COVID pandemic uh, and how important infection prevention and control are. So I think what we did um, with the partnership is just raise that profile and make sure the hospital at a very high level were very, very engaged with the importance of IPC activities. Uh, and I think this has proven to be very important uh, when we've been shifting into more COVID related activities. Uh, these are just some photographs. So uh, that's myself and uh, Dr. Musa, who's an obstetrician uh, at Coempe and Malago Women's, who's the, the Uganda lead of the partnership project, uh, and some of the posters that we developed as part of the partnership activities. And then the picture on the right is uh, Chris Moody and some of our Uganda partners uh, in Cambridge uh, on a reciprocal visit that happened during the partnership project to um, have some mutual reciprocal learning uh, activities which happened. Could I have the next slide, please? So I think, as I mentioned, I think the key achievement really is embedding uh, and we're raising the profile and then embedding IPC activities as a central focus for the hospital's activities. Uh, and what, as part of that, we supported the manufacturer of alcohol hand rub within the hospital itself. So um, this, this got round the procurement and supply issues that can sometimes be a problem. Uh, and it allowed the hospital to manufacture its own alcohol hand rub uh, and improve uh, hand hygiene opportunities in all the clinical areas. Uh, and this is a fundamentally, a major achievement of the project. Um, we um, supported the establishment of the MTC activities, so the Medicines and Therapeutics Committee meetings, uh, and started with the development of specific antibiotic guidelines uh, with relevance to obstetric care and neonatal care. Uh, and that was a big achievement of our project as well. And we get, we've carried on supporting those activities. Uh, and I think there's been a benefit for our, the, Cambridge the Cambridge part of the team. So many of the members who are involved from the Cambridge side uh, went on to take a leadership uh, position when it came to managing COVID uh, back in the UK. Uh, and I think that, they, that the things that they gained from the partnership and the things that they learned in Uganda uh, were very, very helpful in um, managing COVID uh, and organising the hospital's response to COVID uh, in the UK, which has been the dominant theme of our work in infection uh, over the last 18 months. I think that when it comes to the challenges for our partnership, um, Obviously COVID is the number one, probably the number one, two and three actually. Um, and this has kind of been a challenge for all of us. Um, so it's shifted our clinical priorities both in Cambridge and also in Uganda. Uh, and, um, and this has been, you know, there's been a real shift in the focus of where we have to put our priorities. But I think what COVID has also ra raises both the importance of IPC, but also the importance of antibiotic stewardship as well. Uh, and um, we've um, shared our COVID learning resources that we've developed in Cambridge with our Uganda partners to try and improve the clinical management of COVID uh, in, in Kampala too. Uh, obviously, we've not been able to travel to Uganda um, since the beginning of the pandemic. So that our last trip to Uganda was in the la latter part of 2019. Um, we've um, shifted to Zoom meetings for our training and support. Uh, but I think because the relationships within the partnership have been so strong, uh, we've been physically distant, but I think we've become much more socially connected. And I think this has been a very, very good thing. So through the, the technologies that we have access to, like Zoom and WhatsApp, we've actually in many ways uh, forged even stronger links than we had perhaps prior to that. Um, so we've kind of forced to be more connected in many ways um, because we haven't been banking on the next trip um, on the horizon. Um, another challenge has been more practical. Um, so it's been difficult to access uh, the antibiotic prescription records. Um, and I think we've been trying to um, perhaps change the way this is recorded in the hospitals we've worked with. Uh, and this has been made it quite difficult to quantify um, the antibiotic consumption, which is going to be, it's really important when we're trying to um, quantify the impact of the interventions that we're trying to put together. Uh, and obviously for that, we also need denominator data, like the bed days, uh, you know, the number of antibiotics used per bed day. It's been quite difficult to calculate that. 
Uh, we've got a fantastic pharmacist on the Uganda side who's become a real champion of this data. Uh, and he's received data on the point prevalence survey um, acquisition. Uh, and he's kind of been very, very embedded in the response there and raising the importance of antibiotic stewardship. And he's taken a real leadership role in trying to access inf information to get meaningful data so we can measure and quantify uh, the impact of the interventions that we're doing. Um, the other thing which has been, which is an observation that they've made on the Uganda side is that um, the hand hygiene infection control prevention um, strategies that we've implemented and trained in has already had an impact on the rates of neonatal infection, uh, which is very, very positive. And we hope that will be continued. Um, and we're trying to get that data um, more crystallized over the next few months. Um, another challenge has been the microbiology diagnostics. Um, so it's quite been, um, the microbiology diagnostics has been challenging generally. Uh, and it's been difficult to create antibiotic guidelines uh, based around when we're often treating infections blindly. We don't necessarily know what we're treating. We don't necessarily know the resistance patterns. Uh, and we're trying to work with the microbiology services there to improve the services that patients get um, so we can get better data to inform antibiotic guidelines. And that's part of our plan for the future. Could I have the next slide, please? So our future direction. So um, obviously, I mean, COVID has put a span in the works to some extent, uh, and also the cuts to UK uh, aid budget has also put a span in the works because we were trying to, we were hoping to get a, a larger partnership grant to build on the activities, but we are looking for alternative sources of funding to build our partnership stronger for the future. Um, so I think that going forward, we are very keen to maintain uh, IPC activities as a central priority for the hospitals. This is fundamental to patient care. Uh, and um, it's also fundamental for antibiotic stewardship as well. So they, they, it's an absolutely key, a key component. And I think the profile of that has become so evidently clear uh, from COVID actually. So it's kind of raised its profile. Our, our, also, our plan going forward was to develop and expand the microbiology services that already are available uh, within uh, with the hospitals in Uganda to improve the diagnostic services for um, the patients that come to the hospitals there. Uh, and our plan going forward is that um, is to provide mentorship and support and training to develop these services within Uganda. And also we continue to, we want to continue to support the activities of the MTC and refine the clinical guidelines going forward for both obstetric medicine and neonatal medicine when it comes to infection management. Uh, and this is some pictures of our partnership team. Uh, we've been, it's been very multidisciplinary, which has been absolutely key, as was mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, we will have a fundamental part to play. And I think it's been a really good opportunity to break down the barriers that have often existed between different clinical specialties. Uh, so we've got doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, technicians, we've had psychologists involved with our project have been, who've been very, very helpful in thinking about how we can change and influence behavior. And it's been fantastic to work as a multidisciplinary team uh, with our Ugandan colleagues. Um, with the shared aim of improving patient outcome. And this is a picture of Ronald on the bottom right, who's the lead pharmacist in Uganda, who's been uh, involved with the ma manufacture of um, alcohol hand rub uh, within Kuempe. Uh, that's all I have to say, but thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and uh, our best wishes to our Ugandan colleagues dealing with COVID at the moment. Thank you, James, for that um, very elaborate presentation. Uh, so, I request if you have any comments, please put them in the chat. In the interest of time, we won't be able to do that. We'll discuss later. So next, I uh, invite the next speaker to go ahead and share their slides and uh, speak. Over to you. And just in case I drop off, um, I request Jess that the meeting goes on in the interest of time. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Louise. Hi, good morning. Um, Louise Acker speaking here from the Cabaroli Health Partnership. If you could just move to the first slide, please. So we decided to um, run our antimicrobial stewardship program through maternal sepsis. I think people have noted this morning um, how invisible AMR is. Um, so I think it's worked out really well to, to link that to maternal sepsis, as, as in the Cambridge case, actually, which is very much on the Richter scale in, in Uganda. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of the key achievements. I think the, the three key achievements are that we've been able to demonstrate that antimicrobial stewardship is life-saving. 
on the basis of the data we have, which is always a bit problematic, we would have anticipated around 12 to 14 deaths from maternal sepsis during the, the time frame of the project. Um, and the, there has only been one. Um, so we think there's quite good evidence there to show that the, the programme has actually saved lives. We've worked out that on average, we've saved um, six bed days um, per patient on the postnatal and gynae ward. So we know and the hospitals acknowledge that this has brought about major savings in hospital funding. And we therefore believe that the AMS intervention um, is actually inherently sustainable and cost saving. Secondly, I think it's really drawn attention to the importance of nurses and midwives at the centre of multidisciplinary teams. Nurses and midwives in Uganda are the only people who are present on a continual basis. And therefore, I think empowering them, uh, they become critical anchors to the other components of the multidisciplinary team. And wound management has become a central focus of our work, and that is very much uh, the prerogative of the nurses and midwives on the team. Next slide, please. Another, or the third, if you like, um, achievement, I think, has been our ability to co-produce um, and co-publish uh, three papers based on the book, well, two papers and a book. Um, this is important for us, not only in academic terms, but in terms of the importance really of having this credibility behind our policy recommendations, which we'll come to later. Um, so next slide. Joe, I'm going to hand over to our uh, Ugandan pharmacy colleague now to outline the uh, key challenges. Thank you so much, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, like uh, the previous presenter, the previous partnership uh, had indicated, um, one of the challenges that we are facing here is um, the capacity for clinical pharmacy. Uh, Dr. Jackson, in the beginning, the commission highlighted uh, the lack of critical staff, especially in pharmacy, as you, as most of you are already aware, even from the ministry's perspective, clinical pharmacy is not yet there in the scheme of service. So as much as we are trying our best to, 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 to practice clinical pharmacy, the ministry does not yet recognize it as a core of, of, of the services which are provided in the hospital. So, uh, there's lack of capacity in terms of the numbers and even in terms of training. So far, I think there's only one university in Uganda which is uh, offering clinical pharmacy. And um, as much as you, 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 you do clinical pharmacy, it's still very difficult to get employment in, um, in the public sector. So that is one of the biggest challenges, capacity for clinical pharmacy. Then, um, on ground, the other, the other challenge which we faced was um, especially with access to antibiotics, laboratory, and, and IPC consumables. From experience, when we were on ground, um, as much as the doctors would, uh, for instance, try to follow guidelines to, to uh, guidelines with their prescriptions, we would find that it is sometimes very difficult for us because we would constantly run out of antibiotics. So for instance, you put a patient on antibiotics for, for, for let me say five days and she can only access it for two days. Or for instance, the, um, the antibiotics not in the hospital, but um, you tell the patient to buy, the patient cannot afford. So it was really a big challenge. Um, in terms of laboratory, laboratory consumables, especially the, the antibiotic discs, you realize that um, Sometimes when you isolate a sample and you want to, maybe you isolate a, a bacteria and you want to test it against a range of antibiotics, you'll find that you have very few discs, maybe for just a few, a few, a few antibiotics. Um, 
So that, that that's really a big challenge and it was trying to derail our efforts. Um, the other third challenge which we faced, um, obviously one of the other achievements that Professor didn't, uh, didn't highlight was that we were able to, to for the first time functionalize the therapeutics committee, but it was not a very easy task. There was a lot of, uh, I, I could say infighting because um, the hospital management felt that perhaps if uh, the MTC is very strong, some of the key decisions, especially in terms of procurement, might be taken over by the MTC. Um, so we found it a challenge, but uh, nonetheless, we, we, we did our best. And uh, so far now, the, the, the MTC is running. Those are the few challenges that, uh, that, that we faced. Of course, there are other smaller challenges, but those were the biggest challenges that we faced. Back to you, Professor. Okay, um, the next slide. That's the biggest challenge. <laughs> we can move on from that. In a sense, COVID has um, really set sets things back or, or shifted the emphasis um, very much so. I think in many ways, COVID has, has, has re-emphasized some of the issues around IPC. Um, and also we're very concerned about antibiotic usage during COVID, but we don't feel now is the time, the right time to, to really broach those issues. Um, it hasn't actually stopped travel for our partnership, um, but it's fundamentally changed everything that's happening at the hospital. Really in the last three weeks, I would say, that's, that's the, the big impact for us. Um, next slide. So plans for the future. I think we just really need to try and hold the fort, um, preserve the gains that have been achieved in the current setting and, and just step, try, try and retain what we have, even though at the moment, even things like the MTC committees are all stopped because of the um, inability to meet. Um, more positively, uh, we've been working actively on wound management and looking at extending that now to other wards, um, the surgical ward and paediatric. Uh, we've set up um, a virtual wound management clinic and we're really pushing ahead in that area. We've had fellowships here in the UK um, who went back last week and we're looking at development, developing wound management clinics in the community, which would reduce healthcare acquired infection, but also COVID. Um, Joe's been very active now in um, pushing forward new hospital protocols and guidelines. We have for the first time a hospital antibiogram and we've been trying to implement that. But again, it's a difficult time during COVID and it may be that we, we wait now um, until we have uh, space to actually return to this. Otherwise, our, our work could be lost, actually. Um, uh, we've been working actively to support uh, dispensing behaviour in community health facilities, and we want to extend that. Um, and we're exploring the possibility of developing new approaches to wound dressing, um, including the use of locally produced honey uh, in Uganda. Thank you. And policy impacts. Um, well, I think one of the main vehicles for policy impact has been the co-production of um, a policy briefing and summary report, which has been distributed by the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda. I think, again, because of COVID, it's probably not the best time to be pushing that. So I think we'll really launch that um, once the current crisis is, is starting to abate. Um, yep. And finally, I think we would like to specifically acknowledge the contribution of one of our colleagues, Irene, who pioneered the use of sugar and honey in wound dressings. Um, sadly, I, Irene died last Saturday um, from COVID on the ward. Um, we'd like to thank the whole CPAMS team and Thet for their funding and support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Louise, for that uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I think uh, may Irene's soul rest in eternal peace. So I welcome the next speaker.
Sister Josephine and Sister Kelo, please go ahead. Hello, do we have somebody to speak? Sister Josephine? Please go ahead and speak. and try and stick within the allocated time so that we are able to have sufficient time for the discussion to finally caught up with the schedule. Please go ahead. Can you, yes, can you hear me the next slide? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah this was establishing effective antimicrobial stewardship in Northern Uganda. Gulu Regional Referral and um, Lacho Hospital. So these are the members. Um, Next slide. These are the lead uh, pharmacists, uh, both uh, from UK and uh, Agulu, Northern Uganda. So we had the lead. Uh, so in established effective antimicrobial uh, stewardship, uh, we had to define it and then we found uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, misuse of the antimicrobials and we defined uh, what is antimicrobial resistance and what is antimicrobial stewardship. Next. So the major and the stronger, uh, the strongest driver was heavy use of antimicrobial and excessive use when seen, wrong drug use, the wrong choice, duration and route, lack of use when necessary. Next. So our aim was to train on AMS and we had to discuss this together with the lead pharmacies from uh, UK, we joined together and the training was successful. So this was one of the success of this project, training that took place between Gulu Regional Referral and Lacho Hospital. And that happened in October, uh, 2019. Next. Next. So the trainers were both, uh, I would say like a trainer both from the UK and uh, Hulu Regional Referral and Nacho Hospital uh, did a great job. And we attained um, a good number of the cadres that were trained. If we, uh, we will see in the next slide, we reached uh, 212 participants uh, during the three weeks. This is another advantage of the training uh, that we have uh, sustainability of the trainers. So the first we train the trainers and this is one of the, the session that those who were trained before are taking lead in training uh, uh, for taking up the antimicrobial uh, stewardship. Next. So that those are the trainers and then the uh, between the two, the, the hospitals. Uh, as I've already said, we achieved it, uh, 212 uh, participants, and we had about 17, uh, the TOTs, and with a number of uh, 12 sessions. Down, you can see the picture, and that was our achievement. We were very happy about that. The next slide.
Sister Josephine, are you there? Sister Josephine. Yes. So this slide shows uh, we are tackling the behavioral part of like prescription dispensing. And so we had a psychologist from UK uh, who trained us on that. Next. Yeah, that is uh, when we were evaluating antimicrobial prescription and exploring the behavioral change. Uh, as one of the effective change that we can make and that can make the professional change their way of prescribing. Next. Uh, we were so happy that we got also the feedback of the training from the participants and they elaborated that uh, the training was good, amazing. They got the knowledge, they're excited and also they made the pledge which we can see in the, in the next slide. So uh, the material was prepared well. We had a positive impact uh, on the staff. So these are the categories of the participants uh, that we had, the nurses, midwife, the medical officers, uh, the clinical officers, pharmacists, dispensers, dentists, and lab scientists. Next. We had also the action plan immediately after the training. Uh, it's not all about training, but to put it in practice. And so both hospital made an action plan that we worked on it in order to put. So feedback to the audits data was made to the MTC and that was done. And in the two hospital, all uh, were very appreciative and of this. Uh, with this uh, feedback that we made, gave us a rise to make uh, form the antimicrobial uh, uh, stewardship committee in both of the hospital, Gulu Regional Referral and the Cho Hospital. And this was key for both uh, hospitals too. Thank you. Uh, next. So we were happy at the end of it, uh, after the training, next. However, we had some uh, challenges uh, that uh, we got, non-compliance with the Uganda clinical guidelines still cut across. Uh, we found out a lot of uh, misuse of the antimicrobials. And we found in both hospital, uh, very little uh, laboratory uh, results are used, especially in prescribing the antimicrobials. And we also found out that not all the cadres were trained because during the training, majority of them were also busy in the clinical work. And uh, so those are the challenges that we met. Um, next, to see our action plan. So that is uh, what shows uh, the percentage, the non-compliant, uh, as we said, you see, you see the compliant part of it is only seven if you can see. And so others complain that they cannot get access to the clinical guidelines. So next. For our future plans, we think that we have to make routine trainings of new prescribers, nurses, pharmacists, and all cadres. Because like as uh, for both hospital train the, the, the interns and new people come in. So we, we feel like through the AMS committee, we continue to train. Then also regular carrying out of the audits, uh, the GPP surveys, et cetera, to see how we perform. We would like this to be regular, like quarterly per year. Then provision of uh, tools that probably could aid in analyzing the prescription electron electronically by prescriber. That would be great, like if a prescriber is prescribing using the computer, the moment you put this one antimicrobial um, uh, medicine, and then you put the next probably, you would be able to, to see that, ah, this is the wrong drug. So that's what we are, we are the future thought that we think would be. Next. So our contribution to the national action plan and recommendation 
Uh, this has also created awareness to the trainees, uh, also created a platform where all the national different actors for AMR could meet to discuss, share, and discuss how to combat AMR. So with our training as antimicrobial stewards should make us also to give in our report at this forum at that forum, the, that platform. Then support to the implementation of national AMR uh, surveillance to foster collaboration and partnership. So this is our recommendation that we are making from this. Um, I think that's, that's what I could make uh, in this presentation. Uh, need to promote innovation in sites of treatment and drug recovery collaborate with international partners. So we want this collaboration to continue and also to promote innovation of diagnostic uh, technology. Uh, we need to enhance operational research of use of antimicrobial patterns with the goals of producing specific stewardship. Uh, we have already seen in the former presentation that was very good. So we need to encourage such. Great need to create a public awareness on the dangers of AMR by the National Drug Authority. We have a lot of drug shops, uh, pharmacies that they don't follow. So NDA has to come in as a, a key uh, to, to make this not to happen. Otherwise the public awareness of it is something that uh, has to be put uh, some, uh, as the first priority. Uh, so that in the drug shop, if we have the pharmacist, we have somebody who know about the use of antimicrobials, we not give uh, a dose or overdose to, a, uh, to the customer. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the summary that I could make from our uh, project uh, establishing antimicrobial uh, stewardship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Josephine, uh, for that um, excellent presentation. Um, so we may have the next presenter. Thank you, and you helped us gain a few more minutes. So thanks for that. So the next, the floor is yours, Dr. Amso. Thank you very much, uh, Shiba. And um, I wish to start off by thanking the earlier presenters for being able to uh, ably share their work. Uh, I think I'm going to be allowed to share my screen so that um, we could have our slides uh, used for the presentation. So I'll be. David, um, yes, you should be able to share your screen now, but let me know if you can't do that. Uh, it seems um, the function is still disabled on my part. But I think it's okay for you to share in case um, I'm not able to get the rights to share uh, the screen from this side. Okay, we'll just change how to do that one second. So I encourage you to write your questions, make comments in the chat box and we'll come back to them in the discussion. Jess, do you mind um, just sharing the slides on our behalf? Yeah. I think it's okay, as long as you can go to the, 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 the second slide and then we'll go on with it, if that's fine. Yeah, of course. So I'll be sharing um, our work together with um, Dr. Linda Gibson, who is the partnership lead from the UK uh, at Nottingham Trent University. And uh, this work has been carried out in Wakiso district. And uh, I'll invite Linda now to just give a brief overview of our partnership before we 
go into some of these key achievements. Over to you, Linda. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to work and, um, and so, uh, we're here as part of the Union Makamura Linda, hello, hello, Linda. I'm afraid we can't hear you. Ah, okay. I moved into this. I'm not on mute. That is better now. Ah, okay. All right. Let me sit a bit nearer. Um. So yes. So the partnership uh, has traditionally focused on the health system. So. so on AMS. Linda, we can't hear you because you're you're not uh, consistently on your microphone. It sounds like maybe you're brushing something against the microphone. Sometimes it just disappears altogether. Oh, okay. Not not very clearly. Not very well. Okay. Oh, we can't hear you at all now. We can see you talking. Oh, we've lost you, and yet you seem to have a strong connection. It's the mic, not the uh, not the video. Are you able to move closer to your laptop? Move it closer, or if you have a microphone, to move it. Okay, just. Uh, Try. That's better. Okay. Is that better now? Okay, let me try again. Can me now? Yes, but I think you need to stay in one position when you okay. get it. Okay. Yes. Okay, so apologies about colleagues. Um, so our partnership group decided uh, to take a one first approach. After that, we wanted to bring in a range of professionals from different backgrounds. So we invited uh, pharmacists and microbiologists and also people from uh, environmental science and animal rural studies to also take part in the project. So very much a multidisciplinary project that focused on one health. And uh, we were very pleased. We had a, uh, and we also had some fantastic pharmacists from uh, booking I'm going to hand over to David to talk about the key achievements. Thank Please. you, Linda, for that. And um, apologies for that um, mishap on um, the connection. But um, in summary, our partnership has uh, achieved a number of, uh, of things. But one of our key achievements is the number of uh, health practitioners we've been able to train uh, using a One Health approach. And here we've been able to involve both health, health practitioners from human health, but also uh, those um, practitioners from the animal health side. Uh, and I must say that uh, our partners, as you heard from um, Buckinghamshire NHS Healthcare Trust, as well as Nottingham County University have been instrumental in these trainings, both uh, during the physical trainings in Uganda in 2019, but also in the virtual trainings uh, we held uh, earlier this year but also having some of the trained health practitioners training so many village health teams, as we call them in Uganda, uh, is something we are, we are quite um, uh, proud of. But also uh, we were able to support the establishment of um, the MTC at Entebbe Hospital. We heard earlier from the commissioner how these MTCs are critical in the functioning of hospitals. And this hospital continues to support operation, uh, operations at the hospital, even during this uh, tough COVID time as many of you would know. But also being able to establish uh, two communities of practice, um, one focusing on health prof professionals, uh, which has, again, practitioners from the human health side, but also animal health side, but also involving policymakers from the Ministry of Health and other ministries, but also other 
individuals who have interest in antimicrobial stewardship as well as antimicrobial resistance. And this is a Google group that has over 400 members, but also having students have their own Facebook uh, group whereby they share their experiences, but also learn across disciplines uh, from public health to veterinary medicine, uh, pharmacy, and so on, which we found to be um, something we, we have uh, ably achieved. Uh, as you can see, we have a publication in Antibiotics Journal um, summarizing some of our achievements, and this can be accessed uh, for those who may wish to read more about our work in Wakiso District. Next slide, please. Linda, can you please talk about um, these yeah. challenges if your connection is better now? Yes, yeah, so I hope that you can hear me now. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, I've got my headphones That's on better, now. Linda. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, okay, so in terms of um, challenges, uh, I suppose our biggest challenge was time commitment. Um, it was a very condensed project, um, quite a short amount of time to deliver a lot uh, and, and very ambitious, but of course we rose to the challenge as we always do, uh, but that also meant uh, it put a it put some pressure back on people in terms of their day-to-day -day jobs and, and their time commitment as well. So, um, so that of course we, we coped with that very ably, um, but it, it, it did put a lot of pressure back on people in their roles. And particularly at the time of COVID when um, you know, people were being diverted, uh, certainly in the UK, and to some extent in Uganda as well at the time, uh, were being diverted to COVID work uh, as the pandemic began to hit. Um, we also, like other, um, like the other partnerships, we had travel restrictions, so we were unable to travel from the UK to Uganda. Um, fortunately, as I heard um, Cambridge say, the Cambridge Partnership talk about, we have a very strong partnership. We very have very strong modes of communication. And I think they very much saw us through, through transitioning onto the virtual platforms for communication. Um, and we actually managed to do one of the trainings, a couple of the trainings virtually, um, which proved a little bit challenging, but thanks to the fantastic facilitation of the Ugandan team, uh, really acting as a bridge between the participants and people who were doing the training from the UK. Again, uh, we managed relatively smoothly. Um, and of course, then is the issue of continuity. Um, but we look forward to hearing more about that uh, over today and tomorrow. So um, always a challenge, but I think very geared up um, to continue. David. Thanks, Linda. Um, so we, in this slide, want to share briefly how our work has contributed to the National Action Plan. And we try to highlight some of our major activities uh, as per the five major objectives of this NAP. But as you can see right from um, objective one, uh, our school activities, uh, especially in uh, primary schools, uh, promoting AMR and AMS uh, clearly contribute to that. Our trainings have also been instrumental. If you go to objective two on IPC, uh, establishing the MTC we feel is directly in line with that. But also our partners in the UK, uh, Buckinghamshire, NHS Healthcare Trust were able to crowd, uh, crowd um, uh, fund uh, and uh, some good resources that enabled us acquire over 100 hand washing facilities that were received as. Uh, in terms of antimicrobial stewardship, the trainings again come into play, but also the workshops that we've held at the hospital, uh, not forgetting uh, the benchmarking visit we supported uh, between uh, Entebbe Hospital and Jinja Regional Referral Hospital. Uh, objective for su uh, surveillance, uh, we conducted the point prevalence survey, uh, which we are writing up at the moment, but also the MTC at the hospital supporting that uh, currently. But also as part of our work, we've been able to carry out a number of, of studies uh, and we are currently writing these up. We have one submitted already uh, to one of the BMC journals, but also the school competitions we believe have been an innovative way of involving these uh, young uh, pupils who we hope are going to become antimicrobial uh, stewards in the very near future. Next slide, please. So 
So moving forward, uh, as you can see, we are really aiming at uh, carrying on many of our activities uh, in terms of capacity building, strengthening the MTC further, in schools, but also at the university uh, at Makerere. Uh, we've also been keen uh, in the COVID times to project currently between a few Makerere and, but also carry out more research and moving forward. In terms of recommendations for the ministry to continue providing those mechanisms where some of the lessons from our work and other partnerships can be uh, shared and taken up to inform policy and practice but also having avenues in which the partnerships can work closely together as we move together to strengthen antimicrobial stewardship, but also minimize the development of um, AMR. Next slide, please, uh, as Linda plans to wind up and also acknowledge some of the key uh, people that have supported our work. Yeah, okay, thank you, David. Um, so, um... We'd like to acknowledge, obviously, the funders, uh, Fleming Fund and Department of Health and Social Care, uh, the CPA and, and SET, as always, very, very supportive partners, and we, we very much appreciate that. I think um, for us as partnerships, the joy has been, you know, developing these extended partnerships and bringing people in and working across disciplines. So working with Buckinghamshire Healthcare, who um, our pharmacists have just been absolutely fantastic, and we really applaud and appreciate their, their going beyond, actually, absolutely, and doing crowdfunding, etc. Um, we'd like to thank uh, people in Uganda, the Ministry of Health and Entebbe Hospital, and the Kiso District local government. I think it's worth saying that uh, we've built very much on relationships that we've had uh, throughout the years and uh, of our partnership, and, and that's been very, very important that, uh, to enable that smooth stakeholder uh, engagement. And of course, then there are our uh, community health workers, students and pupils, again, who, you know, always very enthusiastic and, and a lot of um, knowledge exchange going on and uh, a lot of enthusiasm. And while David mentions what we did with the schools just in passing, actually just looking at that in detail is so inspiring. Um, you know, it is these young people who are the future of um, AMS championing. Um, and, and thank you to all who've been involved both in Uganda and the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you, Linda and David for that uh, excellent presentation. So, I take the opportunity to welcome Professor Kitutu. Please go ahead and share with us about your work in Ginger. Over to you. I think, I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shiba. Uh, I request to be allowed to share the slides. Uh, I've made some, uh, uh, some, uh, I thank you. I thank you very much, Shiba, our health partnership. Uh, uh, consisted of uh, the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and then uh, the U University College of London Hospitals. So I will ask uh, uh, Professor Claire to give an introduction, then I will run us through our, our slides and conclude. Uh, Claire Chandler, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Freddie. Um, I will just say, um, uh, of which we could say at the start or the end is a huge thank you to all of the people who participated um, in this partnership. Um, it was really, really led by Freddie, who um, was really impressive when he put together his initial plan for this partnership, um, which really carefully addressed the ways in which the medicines and therapeutics committees could be mobilized for antimicrobial stewardship um, and, and was you know really focused on tangible and implementable activities. Um, I think it's been, it's been a real pleasure to work with the different people in this partnership, many of whom we have been working with before, but some dimensions of it 
we're, we're new for different, uh, different points of connection across the partnership. And it's been really great to see that grow um, and, and a really exciting project. I mean, um, the other person that I should really mention um, in Ginger Hospital is William Alum, who really made things happen. And I think it's a really good example of how individuals can really do a lot. Um, and one of our challenges moving forward, of course, is how we move beyond simply asking for volunteer uh, champions um, to take this kind of activity forward and really institutionalize it and embed it, whether that's to do with stewardship or infection prevention control. Um, and those are, you know, continuous challenges with how to make things sustainable. Um, but certainly, I think this has been hugely successful and more so than I had uh, imagined it could be a uh, partnership in terms of what it's managed to achieve in a short amount of time during coronavirus too, and, and really working on the backs of, of volunteers. So um, I really applaud all the people who've been involved in our one and, and the other very impressive presentation that we've heard just now from the rest of the Uganda teams. And yeah, it's great to hear all of this progress. So I shall pass over to Freddie to tell you a bit about our particular project. Uh, thank you very much, Claire, for the kind remarks. And uh, we're also joined by James Capisi from the IDRC. Our project uh, uh, was titled Capacity Sharing uh, for Antimicrobial Stewardship in Ginger Hospital. And what you see in February 2019, when we started, our first task was to complete the bridge. That was uh, the state of the Ginger Bridge. So Uganda, uh, the, uh, you cannot get to Ginger without going through that bridge. And through the, the support of the partnership, I think we also created our own bridge among the institutions that uh, we've mentioned, uh, Claire at London School, Preet at uh, University College London, McCray University, myself, IDRC, James Capisi and colleagues, and then Ginger Hospital at the beneficiary site. So that's what the slide is depicting. Uh, in terms of our plans, uh, the, the project intended to to, to do a comprehensive work in one place. And uh, we looked at uh, doing, uh, focusing on the antimicrobial stewardship and IPC subcommittees that uh, uh, we conceptualized to be within the medicine and therapeutics committee that is, uh, is well guided uh, with a policy document from the Minister of Health. But of course, we knew that these eventually are part of health service delivery in Ginger. So we started with a baseline assessment of what happens and uh, that included the survey of health workers, which we are writing up, and then the point prevalence survey, a couple of qualitative interviews led by our partner, the Manchester Change Exchange team that was supporting the behavior change. And then eventually, with that information, we, we put together a couple of interventions, largely uh, focused on capacity building, where we, we had several meetings with colleagues uh, uh, in Ginger Hospital and also uh, two trainings where we train not only the members of the MTC, but also the health workers on the importance of antimicrobial stewardship and some ways in which they could address the work. And of course, eventually after the period, we hoped that uh, we should have uh, uh, strengthened the antimicrobial stewardship program within the MTC activities at Ginger Hospital. I'll share some pictures of the activities uh, but before that, uh, I, will, I will look at uh, the three key achievements. Uh, one of those was a strengthening implementation of antimicrobial stewardship interventions by the MTC at the hospital. When we started, uh, members had been nominated, uh, but uh, uh, they were not uh, operating as an MTC. So we supported them to come up with terms of reference, uh, how to hold meetings, the issues to address, and also to conduct uh, the, the PPS, the Global Prevalence uh, Survey, and use, interpret the, the, the findings and use those to actually direct their efforts. And I must say that Ginger Hospital was uh, very keen on this. Uh, they took up the findings, particularly those on the uh, use of antimicrobial, uh, antimicrobials in surgery and tried to address, to reduce. We found that a lot of uh, prophylaxis for surgical uh, procedures uh, lasted three days or more, and uh, the MTC took that up and tried to, to address, uh, 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 to understand why, why, why uh, the prophylaxis was for so long and, 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 and put in place measures to ensure that any prescriptions of some of those antimicrobials was authorized. We also, of course, successfully conducted antimicrobial use audit uh, with uh, 
supporting Ginger, but eventually they started doing it on their own to, to identify and address other drug use and microbial drug use challenges. We also supported uh, together with the other ACW pumps, the, the revitalization and operation of the antimicrobial stewardship and operation and optimal access technical working groups. So the AMRNAP in Uganda has technical working groups that provide leadership and guidance. And we're part of the team uh, that revitalized that, I think, in 2019 and 2020. We had uh, quarterly meetings where every implementer was sharing their findings and getting guidance. Uh, these are some of the photos from the field. So you see after training uh, in one of the sessions, uh, that's the photo on, on, on your left on the screen. Uh, we, many of the participants pledged to become antimicrobial guardians and to practice. Uh, the other photo is, is from one of the slides uh, showing uh, why MTCs need, uh, need to exist and, and what they do. And these are again additional. On the left, we see a session where an official from Minister of Health joined us uh, to, uh, to address uh, the, the, the health workers from Ginger and clarify why this is an important priority. The, the, the trainees on your right were recognized for participating with certificates of recognition, which uh, was, was a very good experience. Some of the training and activities were done collaboratively, and we see a picture on our right where we're joined by Claire, Prit, and uh, uh, Karina from uh, the Manchester Change Exchange, Prit from USLH, and uh, Claire, who, 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 whose kind words we just had. And then we also supported at national level, the picture on the right is uh, from one of the meetings of the Technical Working Committee at the Minds of Health, where the health partnerships were sharing our findings and getting guidance and clarification. We did some data collection and here we see the team are being trained to do the data collection uh, uh, that included uh, assessing uh, antimicrobial resistance awareness among health workers, but also other gaps and needs at Ginger Hospital. We supported the, the hospital to also be able to carry out their own uh, MTC meetings and CMEs. So the project acquired uh, a good uh, set of the art computer that they now use as part of their training, and that's the photo you see on your right. In terms of uh, uh, specifically USL uh, participated in the initial analysis of the process of setting up the antimicrobial committee, uh, identifying the different disciplines that required, and then uh, aspects of microbiology and pharmacy. And they also created a video that showed uh, how uh, antimicrobial stewardship is carried out at PSLH. Uh, this video was shown to staff in Ginger, again, uh, for cross uh, for cross pollination or rather cross uh, cultural and cross disciplinary learning, demonstrating the key points of foster successful stewardship programs through the antimicrobial subcommittee. The biggest challenges, as noted, of course, COVID disrupted all our plans when we wrote the proposal we really, uh, uh, we didn't have COVID in mind. And the pictures you see are from the good old days where we could sit next to each other and so on and so forth. It's no longer possible. Inadequate resources, so Ginger was very enthusiastic. They actually wanted every time we, we met and discussed, they always wanted to do more. But of course, the challenge of resources, of time, personnel, but also materials for some of the ideas they had. And then of course, stewardship, the way we, 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 envisaged, we envisioned it was to review a lot of the medical records and see whether we could identify issues. So there was a challenge of incomplete and missing information in the patient medical records. But part of what we did was to work with the nurses to improve uh, the record keeping as a basis for antimicrobial use audits and IPC audits as, that, as the only sustainable and cheaper way. Our plans for the future, the MTC in Ginger continues to implement uh, what they learned. Uh, the, most recently, they supported the entire hospital uh, that uh, David and uh, Linda have just uh, spoken about on how to extemporaneously reconstitute our call up rub, which is a cheaper way as opposed to always buying them off the shelves of the pharmacies. Uh, they continue to support uh, uh, Olum and myself continue to be part of the technical working committee, including uh, James Capisi, and uh, uh, to coordinate any emerging activities. 
And then of course the collaborations of the institutions again uh, remain in place uh, on other activities and opportunities to work together. And of course, uh, we look forward, we were very disappointed uh, with the, the, the cut in funding for, for the PHS because we had a good, I think a good idea for funding, but again, uh, that's the reality. We look forward to other opportunities to continue. In terms of contributions of the project, as again, very much related to what I've said, we supported in the dissemination of the Medicine and Therapeutics Committee manual as a key document for implementing and microbial stewardship in health facilities, established a mechanism for coordinating the technical working group that continues up to today. We still participate in facilitating and coordinating the meetings and getting guidance from the Ministry of Health officials, supported the surveillance of antimicrobial use among inpatients. Again, uh, that's, I think, uh, uh, that year, uh, because of the CW pumps, uh, four hospitals were able to report to the GPPS database in Antwerp, and I think that was an achievement, which is very much part of what is stated in the AMR National Action Plan in Uganda. With that, we are grateful, as Claire mentioned, to everybody, CW, PAM, CPA, and all the institutions that participated. And I believe that uh, by and large, we completed the bridge between the institutions and we are happy uh, that uh, we are sharing this and look forward. Uh, and uh, of course, I also congratulate David and Linda. I was part of that work as well. And we are very happy uh, that uh, we are sharing this and hopefully can take this forward. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, uh, Shiba. Thank you, Freddie, for that uh, presentation and for completing the bridge in tandem with the actual bridge being completed. Um, so I think now we go to the next uh, session. It's 1.42 here. So... I think we've gained some time. So the next is the discussion. And um, during this discussion, one, we have an opportunity to go through, to respond to the comments that uh, have been shared. Um, so Jess, yes, go ahead and share your screen. Uh, unfortunately, I've dropped off several times, so I have lost the comments in the chat. But I know there was a comment, there were a couple of questions from uh, my lecturer, my teacher, Dr. Najuka. So kindly, you can raise them now, if you don't mind. Go ahead and speak now, and we have the, uh, the presenters respond to them, or the rest of the participants. And thank you, Jess, for projecting the notes. I think this uh, is an opportunity. If there's anything that we've missed that you think is critical as presenters, uh, it's an opportunity you can share. But Dr. Najuka, please go ahead and raise the question you had raised earlier. Okay, looks like Dr. Najuka left. Had we captured that question? Yes, she, she did leave, but she, her question was, how are the MTC utilizing data from respective microbiology labs? Is such data also being used to inform IPC? Okay, thank you very much. So our presenters, Freddie, You've spoken passionately about the MTC in Jinja. So how is data utilization in that MTC? And then we can hear from the other uh, partnerships as well. Thanks, Claire, for capturing that. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shiba, uh, uh, for, for that question. Uh, uh, in Ginger Hospital, one of the things that uh, we actually grappled with uh, early on was they intended to set up an ant biogram uh, using uh, the, the data from the lab. And uh, one of the things we, we discussed and tried to support them to do is to ensure that one, uh, they had they understood what an ant biogram is and uh, what, what it took to actually create one for the hospital and eventually the implications of that. And uh, our areas with that we identified was one to be able to, uh, to ensure that uh, they had adequate samples in terms of numbers, but also to capture the information from the lab in a way that uh, uh, is useful for the MTC. Uh, so eventually over the time, we did not get uh, to the point of uh, of, uh, of, 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 of supporting them to build an antibiogram, but they appreciated uh, what they needed to do. But then eventually they used uh, uh, their laboratory findings to, to guide. So eventually our focus moved from setting up a hospital-based antibiogram to using the laboratory findings to inform treatment decisions, which is uh, again, a practice level, low level output. And uh, with that, uh, 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 the pharmacist Olum with the chair of the MTC, they were able to eventually ensure that they improved uh, the, the flow, the time between requesting a lab result and getting uh, findings back, but also uh, uh, ensuring that consumers are always available because that uh, is, is one of the challenges in Ginger and many hospitals uh, in, in Uganda that uh, the, the reagents and consumables to do microbiology lab are not always available. And if they are, sometimes the results take too long. And then lastly, uh, what happened was uh, to, to set up uh, uh, some restrictions on some of the antimicrobials, uh, particularly those that belong to the reserve and watch group, where any prescription of those would only be authorized by a consultant or hire, a consultant physician or pediatrician or hire. And I think that uh, that was uh, eventually to to, to address uh, the challenges uh, that were there, but also promote antimicrobial, uh, appropriate antimicrobial use, but also not denying uh, patients uh, medicines that they need because of the challenges in the lab. So in a way it's, it's work in progress. And as I mentioned, uh, they, were, they went on to do a point prevalence survey focusing on just one of the wards, and that was a, a maternity uh, to observe uh, the use and I, they identified the number of challenges. Some of them uh, included uh, what we had mentioned earlier, uh, the, 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 the gaps in the records that are taken, but also the fact that uh, many times uh, the, the duration for prophylaxis for surgical procedures was longer than, uh, than what is recommended or what was required. And they started acting on that again by ensuring that prescriptions are by consultants, and then also ensuring that nurses are able to monitor the patients uh, and, and report. So uh, to summarize, it's, it's work in progress, but I think uh, uh, we, we achieved uh, quite a number of things. Thank you. Over, and uh, I request uh, to, to leave the meeting now. However, we have James Capisi and, and Claire uh, to continue any, 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 any any clarifications from our health partnership? Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You much uh, can I add to our partnership as well? Is that okay? Just to add to what you yes. were saying. And um, because I think in answer to this question, is there are these multiple levels which Freddie was talking about, um, and we had some kind of questions raised from the UCLH team in in the UK saying. You know, how appropriate is it to use a relatively small sample of data from the hospital to create a localized antibiogram? And it sort of stands in tension with the idea of a more epidemiological approach that has a larger denominator and looks at what, you know, how often um, you would actually see cases of resistance. Because one of the challenges is if you create an antibiogram on the cases that you've only tested a few who, were, who ended up being resistant, you can end up imagining that drugs are resistant to uh, that, that um, the bugs are resistant to many of the first line drugs, and you end up escalating treatment, um, you know, on more occasions than is required. So it's, it's a bit of a tension between wanting to create 
low plant biodimes and having enough data from which to be able to do that. Um, so the, the thought from the London team was more, um, you know, the data should feed into a national system which decides um, on what the antibiograms look like um, and the guidelines for first and second line treatment and so on. Um, and so then you move to that stage, that second point that Freddie was talking about, where it's more about individualized testing um, of particular cases to see what they are resistant to. But obviously building up a picture locally that these, you know, when you're seeing those resistant cases and continuing to surveil that, but the tension between having surveillance locally in the hospital and using that data to inform clinical decisions, but not ending up, um, you know, imagining that that means that all patients that come in are going to be resistant to those first line drugs. So I think there's a, it's a real challenge, I think, for how to manage that information um, appropriately between the national level and the regional level. Okay, um, thank you for that additional share uh, regarding data. And Al I can see Alan has made a uh, posted sharing the experience in their partnership in Kavarode. They isolated certain bacteria, which are routinely associated with hospital acquired infections. They shared this laboratory data with hospital management and hospital IPC efforts were greatly strengthened. So I think that has been answered. And um, again, Alan asks that one of the challenges they had in the Cabarode Health Partnership was frequent stock out of antibiotics. How have the other partnerships handled this issue? So other partnerships, do you want to share on that? How have you navigated around the issue of uh, antibiotic stockouts, frequent stockout of antibiotics? Okay, um, maybe as we think through the response to that, um, it would be good again to hear from you, uh, our partners on, on um, how you went about, you know, working together, both in UK and in country to scale up, what plans do you have in scaling up? And I raise this, uh, of course, within the complicated context that we are living in now with COVID. Uh, how are you planning on this or what are you doing already working together in country to scale up? Okay, I think there were other questions that I missed. Um, so these were questions <laughs> from Sister Josephine around the Gulu project. Um, uh, Claire to Sister Josephine, thank you for the impressive presentation. I'm interested in the pledging you mentioned, but I didn't see the slide. Would you be able to put that slide up again and mention a bit more about pledging? And then to from Prima to you, Sister Josephine, how are you engaging the district leaders and under the leadership? She's looking at the health team, veterinary production sectors in the district in AMS. So those are two questions on the pledge and then on multi-sector engagement. 
of district leaders in AMS. Helen, do you want to say something or Sister Josephine? I see your microphones are on, but I can't hear anything. So Sister Josephine, the floor is yours. Can you hear now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, because I had not put the earphone. Um, thank you for the question. I would like to, to say about the pledges. I, I think the slide was there probably went off. Um, that was like uh, when after the training of the participants and we all agreed that we want to go back and make change. Uh, so we asked all the participants to pick one of the pledges that you feel you can act on it immediately. And so many of them, uh, they went up with, it was like a kind of card that you're going back with it home uh, so that when you reach, you say, okay, one of them like would say, that I will try to, uh, to work, uh, follow the guidelines, like the prescriber following the guidelines. And so like that, that, that was what for each of the participants that they pick here. Yeah. So uh, as we can see it here, uh, like if an antibiotics, I'm taking number four, if an antibiotic is unavailable, I will contact the prescriber and request an alternative. Uh, so those are like uh, one of the participants said I will do that, especially in OPD outpatient where like sometimes they prescribe um, uh, a medicine that is not within the hospital and probably they can get it out and say, okay, another, I will try to go and contact the prescribers. So we were happy that uh, everybody was willing uh, to do something, any change uh, to curb the antimicrobial overuse. Um, about collaborations, uh, since we, we were both uh, Gulu Regional and then the Lacho Hospital, we, one, one, one key uh, uh, achievement that we did was like the formation of, uh, the, formation of the antimicrobial uh, stewardship as a subcommittee of the MTC uh, in, the, in both the hospitals. So then uh, in that case, like uh, having, having formed that, that would be also responsible because that is a subcommittee to medicine and therapeutic committee. And so we said um, in this, we would have to carry out uh, the, 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 the audits of uh, analyzing the use of antimicrobial stewardship. I mean, antimicrobial use and, and getting involved uh, to let's say like the district and whatever, the report that we get from this audit is the one that is shared across through the medical uh, directors that also like they are invited in this uh, uh, other meetings that they join together. And that is a way forward that we felt uh, uh, this could change uh, in the region. Uh, so that is how we, so now constantly we are doing, um, especially the audit. We thank God also that um, through the medicine and therapeutic uh, committee at the national level, they are also doing this uh, frequent uh, uh, surveillance. That is the global point uh, prevalence study uh, carried at Gulu Regional Referral and also St. Mary's Hospital. Recently, we had one that has been done here and equally in Gulu Regional Referral. And those are the key uh, results that informed uh, the use of antimicrobial within the, 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 the region and subsequently is passed uh, ahead and then it goes to as a kind of policy that can help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Sister Josephine, how are you working with the, the teams from the animal sector? Um, of the animal, animal production. Animal production, the veterinary. That was another question. 
Yes, that was another question. However, we are still at the initial thing, which I think we 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 are still forming that relationship between uh, the veterinary door in Gulu okay. here. We do not. Uh, um, there is another there in terms of moving forward with the one. Yeah. Come again. Hello. I think Hello? we might we might have lost um, Dr. Sheba briefly, um, but I, I did have a question relating to the One Health um, aspect, which feeds in almost your um, to to the question around um, engagement with the other sectors. So I know that the um, the Nottingham Trent University partnership with the Macquarie School of Public Health and the Buckinghamshire Buckinghamshire Trust um, did quite a lot of work on the One Health approach and I wondered if they had any recommendations for other partnerships who might want to take that approach um, and whether there are any learnings from their interactions with the other groups outside of the human health sector. For example, did you encounter any challenges in terms of training? Did they take different approaches which, which might need to be considered? Um, thanks, B. Um, I can start on, on that and any other member of the partnership could chip in. Um, our experiences of um, having our work take a One Health approach are, are quite uh, are good. And um, one thing that I can fondly remember is that when we had our trainings and uh, of course they involved both human and animal health uh, practitioners, the animal health um, practitioners were actually very pleased uh, that you know they were thought about and involved in, in such an initiative and of course it was evident that many of the uh, activities have been geared more towards the uh, human health professionals having the uh, veterinary practitioners left out so that was something that came out very uh, clearly but also noting that in most of the sessions it was quite evident that most of the stewardship um, issues cut across both human and animal health. And that even justified the need for partnerships and other stakeholders to really have a One Health approach moving forward. Because again, it's really a very thin line to draw between stewardship in the animal side and also human health side. So I think those experiences are worth uh, sharing. But in terms of moving forward, I think one of the things we did uh, quite uh, well was to involve the key stakeholders in both sectors early in our work. So not only the Ministry of Health, but also the Ministry of um, um, Animal Industry, Fisheries and Agriculture in Uganda. But also from the university side, it was not only us from the health side, but also involved our colleagues from the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine, as it's uh, uh, normally called. But also from the UK side, um, the, whereas we had um, uh, professionals from uh, the hospital in Buckinghamshire and also Nottingham Trent University for, for the public health. We also involved uh, practitioners and faculty from the animal health side, including from the School of um, Rural and Animal Studies uh, at NTU. So I think having stakeholders involved early from both human and animal health would be instrumental for partnerships willing to, to take on a one health approach in their work. Thank you, Dr. Musaki. That was um, very interesting. I don't know if, if anybody from any of the other partnerships has any questions around for, for Dr. Musaki around the approach that they took. Nope, it doesn't seem so. Um, I wonder if anybody, I, another question I had, I don't, I don't know if anybody else has got any other questions, do you put them in the chat? But I was just wondering how we might, um, going forward, engage with private pharmacists as well as um, those involved in public hospitals. I don't know if anyone has any experience around that. B, this is David again. Just to share uh, our experiences uh, from the veterinary side. So in our training, since there were not so many veterinary workers from the public sector. We actually also involved some from the private sector. And these were vets who were involved in uh, you know, a small um, 
um, um, drug shops for animal health and other private activities, including, of course, moving around villages, uh, treating animals. But we actually realized that they were very eager to participate in, in such initiatives and also um, learn and carry on the initiatives in their own practice. So whereas we didn't involve any private practitioners from the human health side, those that we were able to reach, uh, uh, reach to from the animal health side were really enthusiastic. And I think moving forward, uh, since that from the animal health side, the, uh, the practice in animal health has probably more people in the private sector than it is in the, in the human health. I think anyone wanting to take on that One Health approach may have to think about the private practitioners, not just for the human health side, but also in the animal health side, where many of the vet workers actually supporting uh, individuals and, and families are actually from the, from the private sector. Yeah, absolutely. We have to move forwards together, don't we, rather than um, just staying within our own sectors. Uh, Dr. Sheba, I don't know if you've been uh, able to reconnect. Yes, I've reconnected and been following the discussion. Um, we still have a couple of minutes, so we can keep the questions coming and comments or clarifications. Uh, but the discussion around, uh, I think, the engagement of the private sector is very critical especially as David has mentioned that in animal health, uh, it's largely private sector driven, unlike uh, in human health. And maybe something else I would want to raise is, you know, COVID has given us an opportunity to test out and see um, the issues around antimicrobial, antimicrobial stewardship in the real world. So it would be good to hear the experiences in you know, how these MTCs are, are trying to navigate around this because I know uh, self-medication has gone quite high. And uh, even when people go to facilities, they are given all sorts of medication. So as partnerships, what's your observation and what are the MTCs doing about this in line with the antimicrobial stewardship champion? Uh, I would like to, uh, to give my contribution to uh, being, um, in the establishing of antimicrobial uh, stewardship uh, that we got. For our experiences, uh, the training has, has really helped because as we see, the MTC actually is uh, one of the standing committees uh, within the hospitals. And uh, AMS, that is antimicrobial uh, stewardship is a subset of uh, of MTC. So it moves that um, uh, AMS will report to MTC. And it's very, very important that uh, there should, every hospital should have a functional and active uh, MTC in order uh, to help this. What I would say is that the MTC would actually make the AMS to do what uh, they would like to report. So meaning like antimicrobial stewardship would go in uh, to do the surveys, let me say, uh, under that term, <clears throat> do the survey of the use of the antimicrobials and would be able to report. And this is reported to <clears throat> MTC. And so that is like the goal that one, uh, the MTC, which is very active would be having in, in their annual report or their quarterly report. So it's, it's very important that we promote this uh, active uh, medicine and therapeutic committee in the hospital or uh, it cut across to the lower levels in order to combat this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sister Josephine. And there's an add-on question from uh, Winnie asking how are the MTCs monitoring use of azithromycin in the hospitals? 
since this is one of the primary drugs that is being prescribed for COVID? Uh, uh, let me also try. Uh, okay, uh, I'm giving an, an example, uh, like in our hospital here. Initially, yes, uh, the use of azithromycin uh, had gone so high in the, in the treatment of COVID. And I think it's, I would say even up to now, is still irrationally uh, probably being used. But as we continue to have um, uh, uh, the updated COVID guidelines that is changing one after another. At the moment, I would say like the use of azithromycin is going uh, down. And uh, I would think uh, many, even like right now up to uh, uh, the community outside, people like feel like I think I have COVID will ask for azithromycin. So what we are doing is that we are not giving now as the thromycin, or we are making it uh, to the prescriber that we should not prescribe as a thromycin now, like anybody having cough and all that when it's not proven. And also to the uh, the COVID treatment center I, uh, unit, I mean, in the hospital, they have also ceased now to, to write as a thromycin. And I think because of the side effects and all that they've seen. Thank you. And thank you for that addition. Is there an experience from elsewhere? Okay, so let's see, is there anything else? So, um, so a couple of challenges were shared and it would be good to hear from you partnerships, you know, uh, how you think you'll be able to address some of these challenges or how you can work collectively to address those challenges. Jess, do you mind projecting the document? Again, the Google Doc. The challenges. So COVID seems to have been a cross-cutting for Kampala, Kabarode. I think drug stockouts were another, antibiotic stockouts are kindly lower. So I think four of the five partnerships mentioned COVID, the COVID restrictions, travel restrictions, and all everything else, the diversion of attention as a, as a key challenge and I think from the projection, we are going to continue grappling with COVID in Uganda, at least for this year. So what strategies can we take up to ensure that the gains of these projects are not lost? Um, Shiba, if I can just talk a bit more about how our partnership um, try to overcome the challenge of COVID, but also have it not affect our work. Um, one thing we decided earlier on in the pandemic was that the plan we had to train more practitioners shouldn't stop, given that, of course, our earlier training had been done uh, physically with the UK team uh, coming to Uganda. And that's why we were able to, in our recent extension, go ahead and have a blended training 
whereby us, the Ugandan uh, partners, were in, in house to support the trainings, but the UK team uh, participating from the UK on Zoom, which again was not uh, as it was during the physical trainings a couple of years ago, but at least it still gave an opportunity for the health practitioners not to miss out on the chance of actually having these trainings uh, go on. And I must say from the evaluations that we did, despite the UK team being uh, uh, participating from afar, the participants were, were again very pleased with how the trainings went and, and you know, the audio was quite good. They were able to ask questions and get feedback from the UK uh, participants. And we've actually agreed as a partnership that even if travel won't be um, possible very anytime soon, we are quite keen to actually carry on any virtual or blended trainings so that our activities can really uh, proceed and ensure that we can benefit more health practitioners both from the human health side and animal health um, sector. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I think we've had a very good uh, discussion. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, we are now moving back into the main plenary session. I encourage you to continue the conversations among yourselves. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.